Hey, in this lesson, we're going to talk about uh, inverse trig antiderivatives uh, as related to U sub. Uh, and I mean, these are problems where the answer is going to be inverse sine, inverse cosine, inverse tangent, something along those lines. If you want to print the sheet that I'm pulling examples from to follow along, you can go to this bit.ly link, sub inv trig, capital S, capital I, capital T. All right, so let's go on, talk about inverse trig. Um, and before we get into the antiderivatives that yield inverse trig functions, we probably need to remember what the derivatives of our inverse trig functions are. And throughout this lesson, if you see the letter u, uh, u is understood to be a function of x. So u is a function of x in all of these cases. So these inverse trig derivatives, I have thrown the chain rule in them. The derivative of inverse sine you should know is 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. But if something is taking the place of the x, then you square that and then you put its derivative in the numerator. So u prime over root 1 minus u squared. And here is inverse tangent and inverse secant. There is some disagreement among textbooks about whether the absolute values should be around that u that is outside the radical there. Um, some textbooks have absolute values, some don't. I personally like to put the absolute values. And because of that disagreement in AP calculus, if you are an AP calculus student, as a matter of policy, they do not put inverse secant or inverse cosecant on the AP exam because of that disagreement among the textbooks. But I like my students to be able to finagle it because it helps them get ready for college. Uh, so let's go on and talk about antiderivatives and how we can use these formulas right here the derivatives to work backwards to antiderivatives. And so uh, if the derivative of inverse sine is this thing, then you could say that the antiderivative of that would be the inverse sine of u plus c. And so that's essentially what we're going to do, except I'm going to add one more thing because sometimes it's not one minus x squared. It could be like a nine or a 16. It could be a different number uh, before or uh, after the u. And that's what these little formulas are going to be used for. And I'm not a huge fan of memorization. I'll go ahead and uncover all of these. I'm not a huge fan of memorization. I'm really bad at memorization, actually. Uh, but there are some instances where I believe the memorized version is so much more efficient that it's worth committing some of these things to memory. And that's what we're going to do here. So i uh, give you a second to write those down, and then I will show you how we will put that into practice in just a little bit. And one thing to think about here is that uh, one thing to notice is that the inverse sine formula is the only one that does not have one over a in front of it. Uh, so let's go on. Let's look at some antiderivatives. So first one, uh, the antiderivative of cosine over one plus sine squared of x. And if we're in the world of substitution, we very frequently choose the entire denominator to be the u. However, in this case, it doesn't work. And I just want to show you real quick what happens if you choose the wrong thing for u. Uh, just remember that when you find du, as I like to do substitution, you find the derivative of your choice for u and the derivative of this. Uh, remember that sine squared of x is the same thing as the quantity of sine x squared, which brings in a chain rule. So the derivative of 1 would be 0. Sine squared would differentiate to 2 sine of x to the first times the derivative of sine, which is cosine x dx. Then we go back to the problem and we want to find that du in the problem. And that is way too ugly. I have the cosine and the dx. I don't have the sine. I'm missing a sine x. And that is the point where you realize that your choice for u was incorrect. And what we're going to do in this particular problem is kind of choose the u and the du in reverse order. I'm not going to write down my u first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look here and I see a cosine x dx. And I'm thinking to myself, that would be a beautiful du if I could somehow let u equal sine x. So I'm letting what's available for the du drive my choice for u. And we can let u be sine x because I have a sine in the denominator. Now it's squared and it's being added to the 1, but that doesn't change the fact that there is indeed a sine present. And the derivative of that sine would be the cosine x dx, which is up here. So as I do the substitution, I will take I will take cosine x dx out of the problem. That becomes my du. Uh, my numerator is in the du, so I'm going to put a 1. And then in the denominator, 1 plus sine squared of x will become 1 plus u squared. And you should look at that and know that that is the derivative of inverse tangent of u. So this is arctan of u. But u is the sine of x. 
and I am going to leave my answer like that. So there is one example. Um, now notice I didn't really use the template that I showed you right here. Um, I really use this when you have something other than a one with the variables in the denominator. And in this case, it was one plus sine squared. So I just kind of did a traditional U substitution. Let's look at number two. Kind of the same situation. Uh, at first, I like to choose the entire denominator for my U. That's kind of my standard go-to if I can. But the derivative of X to the fourth would be 4X cubed. And I don't have enough X's up here. I only have an X to the first. So I, again, am going to let what's available for my DU drive my choice for U. And I'm looking here. And I'm thinking that 2X, 2X would be a great derivative if I could somehow let U equal x squared. If I can let u be x squared, then du is 2x dx, which is there ready to be used. And there is an x squared down here. And if you need to, you can rewrite the problem. Instead of x to the fourth, you can think of that as x squared squared. And now we are ready for substitution. u is x squared. du is 2x dx. The du is there ready to go. So 2x dx, that's going to come out and become a du. I'll put a 1 on top of the whole place. The denominator, 1 plus x squared squared will become 1 plus u squared. And once again, we're back to inverse tangent. So that'll be inverse tangent or arc tangent. I kind of go back and forth how I want to write that. The inverse tangent of u and u is x squared plus a c. So there is example number two. And again, that was a 1 plus uh, the u squared in the denominator, not like a 9 or a 16 or any other number. So I didn't use that memorized formula that I showed you a minute ago. I'm going to show you those. I'll show them to you. Uh, all right. So 3 is going to be a similar situation to those first two that we did. Uh, I would like to let my denominator or choose my u from the denominator. And a common place to look for u is under a radical. So if you tried to let u equal 1 minus e to the 2x, when you find the derivative of that, we run into a bit of a problem because the derivative, well, 1 zeroes out. But the derivative of e to the 2x is 2e to the 2x. The negative would stay there. And I can put a 2 and a 1 half, but the problem is this is 1x, not a 2x. I can't complete my du if I let u be 1 minus e to the 2x. So that's how I know that that was a bad choice for you. And again, just like the previous two, I'm looking at what's available for my du. What's available for my du and what I have is an e to the x. That is a great du if I could somehow let u equal e to the x. And e to the 2x, you actually can make that an e to the x because e to the 2x is the same thing as e to the x squared. It is e to the x squared. And now I have my du. There's the derivative of my u. If I can let u be e to the x. And I can. So now when I substitute that, this will give me the antiderivative. e to the x dx. I take that out first and replace it with a du. I will put a 1 in the numerator to hold the place. In the denominator, I have the square root of 1 minus. And that was e to the x squared, but e to the x is u. And 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared would be the derivative of the inverse sine of u. And u is e to the x. And you'll notice for this problem, I didn't formally write down u equals this, du equals this. Uh, I kind of expedited the process a little bit just by kind of circling it and making note that I do have my u and I do have its derivative in the problem. And there is your antiderivative for number three. And once again, it was one minus the u squared. It wasn't a different constant. It was a one. So I didn't really use that memorized formula. But that changes on number four. Number four uh, is almost inverse uh, tangent. As a matter of fact, if this nine were a one, if that nine were a one, then this is inverse tangent. But it's not a nine I'm sorry, it's not a 1, it is a 9. So this time I will use the formula for inverse tangent right here. And what I need to do is identify a u. Its derivative needs to be in the numerator. And I need to uh, find out what number I'm squaring to get this. And so what I'll do is I'm looking here. The 9 is 3 squared. So that tells me that my a value is 3. 
I am squaring a single X. So that tells me that U is just X and the derivative of that U prime would be one and that's what's up here. So this problem is in the form U prime over A squared plus U squared. And if you recognize that you are in that form, then the answer is going to be one over A. So one over three inverse tangent or I wrote arctan, whatever of u and my u is x over three plus c and you are done you are done um, there are algebraic ways you can go through and do a more formal substitution and feel your way through the problem on your own to get one third inverse tangent of x over three um, but it's it opens the door to a lot of careless mistakes and i tend to make careless mistakes when i try to do this a more algebraic or, or more uh, formal method so that's why i prefer using the memorized formula. So there's how to do it with inverse tangent. Let's see what else we have here. Um, okay, so by, oh goodness, that's kind of ugly. Um, you could try doing a substitution where this is your U. The problem is the derivative of what's under the radical would be negative 36 X cubed. And I don't have an X cubed. If this were an X cubed, then I would do substitution with U equaling the, what's under the radical, but I don't, that's not gonna work. Uh, and so I noticed that it is a number minus something squared. And I know in the back of my mind, the derivative of inverse sine has a number minus X squared in the denominator. So I'm just kind of thinking about the derivative of inverse sine. This kind of resembles that, which makes me think I want to see if I can get this formula for the inverse sines antiderivative to work here. And so I'm looking here, I'm looking, I'm looking and 25, I may, you know, what, I'm going to rewrite this because the formula has things being squared. It's a squared and it's u squared. Let's rewrite what's under that square root so that it resembles more of what I have in the memorized formula here. So 25 is five squared. Nine is three squared and x to the fourth would be x squared squared. Now, if I look at that, I see an a value of five. I see a u value, the thing being squared, is 3x squared. And then I need the derivative of that u. I need u prime in the numerator. The derivative of 3x squared is 6x. I have the x. I am missing a 6, but that's not a problem. I can put a 6 and a 1, 6. And as soon as I do that, now I have my u prime in the numerator. So with that 6, I now have completed this little formula, this little template, and the antiderivative of the inverse sine. So the antiderivative itself is going to be the inverse sine or the arc sine of u over a. u is 3x squared. My a value is 5. And that takes care of the inverse sine. But keep in mind, I had to inject a 6 to complete my u prime. I offset that with the 1, 6. That 1, 6 comes along for the ride out here. And so there is your answer for this problem. And I think I have two more. Okay, number six. And this is going to be probably one of the trickier ones. And we'll finish number seven is a nicer one. Number six, I see an X on the outside. I see the square root of stuff. Notice that it's X minus the number this time. It's variable minus number, not number minus variable. And that makes me think of inverse secant. And so we are going to think about the inverse secant template for this one because it's variable minus number under the radical, not because there's an X on the outside. The X on the outside does make me think inverse secant, but it's more specifically that it's X minus number, not number minus X. And so I'm going to rewrite this again, kind of like I did the last one, because I like seeing the things squared. I don't like that exponent of four. So I'm going to make that one over X square root X squared squared minus one, which one is just one squared. I'm not going to bother writing one squared dx and if i want this to be inverse secant or arc secant um, i need to pick my a and my u so my a is one the square root of one is one my u is x squared and my du i'm sorry my u prime is what i'm calling it here my u prime is 2x dx and here's where we start to run into a problem the two is not a problem. I'm, I'm trying to satisfy the U prime requirement. I can very easily just multiply by two 
and put a one half. Okay, my two's taken care of. The issue is that I am missing an X. And up until this point, I've told my students that if you're missing variables, that's a problem. I've told them that it's possible to fix it, but it's pretty rare. Um, and usually if I need to inject missing variables, I will abandon ship and find and use a different technique. However, this time I need to put an X in here to complete my U prime. I need to put an X up there and you can do that. Except when you account for that, I multiplied by an X. I have to now divide by an X to offset the X that I put in the numerator. Unlike constants, you cannot put a one over X on the outside. If it's a variable that you inject in the problem, you must account for that inside the antiderivative. So the two, I can put a two here and a two on the outside. For the X, I put an X on the inside here. I need to divide by X down here. Now I have my U prime. My U prime is 2X DX. There's my U prime. So I have my U prime. I have my U squared. I have my A squared. And on the outside, I need a U. And this is the beauty of this problem. When I multiply by that second X, but when I put that X down there, I created an X squared and that is my U. And so the X in the numerator satisfied my U prime. The X that I put in the denominator also satisfied the U that needed to go out here. And so the antiderivative, this is now ready to go. I'm in this template formula. The antiderivative itself, ignoring the one half on the outside, is one over A. So I'll be one over one. So I, I guess I'll write one over one. One over A inverse secant of U, which was X squared, over A plus a C. And then the one half on the outside is going to come along for the ride. So one half times that, uh, which would obviously just be one half inverse secant of X squared over one X squared plus C. That's a weird one. Inverse secants tend to be a little bit tricky because you oftentimes will have to inject that missing variable. And you can do that just as long as you account for it within the squiggle S and the DX. You don't want to go outside the antiderivative to account for the missing X. Uh, all right. And the last one. This is going to be a little bit nicer when compared to the one I just finished. Um, I see addition down here. It is X minus two quantity squared, but this is an inverse tangent template. I see a number plus something squared, and that is exactly what inverse tangent would provide if you found the derivative of an inverse tangent function. And so my U is the entire quantity of X minus two. U prime, the derivative of that would just be one, which is exactly what I have up here. So I like that I have my U prime and my U. And then 16 is four squared. So that would be my A value of four. And so the answer to this, this is already in the format. I don't need to make any adjustments. I don't need to multiply by anything in the numerator. It's gonna be one over A. So that's one over four inverse tangent or arc tangent of U over A. U is X minus two, A is four plus C, and we are done with that one. So seven ended up being really nice after that brutal number six. So there are seven examples of inverse trig or antiderivatives that yield inverse trig functions, and we will polish these out more later.